Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries, Church at the Barn, Saturday Night Life. I do want to say that it, it, we're, we're on live. So, hi, hi, everybody. We're running a little late in the building tonight, and, uh, and I, got a, I got an assignment by God to do here, so I'm going to do it. And if I run later than your evening can, can tolerate, just know I'm not bothered by people getting up and leaving. I've preached stuff that's drove people out of the building before and didn't bother me then. It sure won't bother me if I'm running late and you need to go somewhere. So um, try not to go to hollering and yelling out in the lobby. But other than that, it won't bother me at all, okay? All right. Do you have your Bibles with you? <clears throat> Would you open them, please, tonight? Wait a minute. I'm really... I uh, I have a notebook, and I really do need to have it. <clears throat> and uh, I believe it's blue, and it might be in my office. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I can get started without that notebook, though. So, uh, I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, turn, please, to Galatians chapter 5. No, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, 3. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, here we go. There's a prayer here that starts uh, in verse, thank you very much. Uh, um, it starts in verse... Fourteen. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would. So this is a prayer that Paul prayed for the churches, obviously, but the New Testament, when it's written to the church, that's the Holy Spirit of God that had Paul write. It's the Holy Spirit prayer that the Holy Spirit had Paul pray for the churches all the time. If it was an anointed prayer then, it's certainly an anointed prayer now. So these kinds of prayers that you find in the Bible, there's a lot of them, there's two of them in Ephesians, there's one in Philippians, there's one in Colossians, they're, they're all over the New Testament. You need to make them, make them alive in your prayer life, and it, kind of like this. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you grant according to the riches of your glory, for us to be strengthened by might in our spirit, our inner man. We thank you and praise you and receive Christ, the anointed one in his anointing, dwelling in our hearts by faith. And we thank you, Lord, that we're rooted and grounded in agape love. And I thank you, Lord, that we're able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth and height and depth breadth and length and depth and height of your love and to know the agape of the anointed one which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah, Lord, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works on the inside of us and we receive while we're listening to this message tonight we receive things going on on the inside of us that only you can do, firing up things that we can know, that we could only know through you, Show, showing us, getting us through the natural haze where our minds work, over into your word where our spirit feeds. And as we're feeding our spirit, our minds are being renewed to understand everything from your point of view, not the world's point of view, but from the God point of view, the God perspective, seated together with you in heavenly places, seeing what's going on in the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you for this position. New Testament believer, temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now we have some notes. An assignment, 
in a, here we go, hang on. Last week, we talked about the name of Jesus. What we're talking about is what the early church had in the book of Acts because they turned the whole civilized world for Jesus in a matter of 33 and a half years. The book of Acts is 33 and a half years. The Gospels cover 33 and a half years of Jesus' life on earth. The book of Acts covers the first 33 and a half years of Jesus as Lord and uh, high priest of the church, Lord of the world, hallelujah. And in 33 and a half years, it is absolutely a God miracle how the word of God grew and multiplied and grew and multiplied and grew and multiplied till it covered the civilized world in just that short period of time. Hallelujah. Now, unfortunately, as time has went by, the enemy of God has got this ridiculous idea ingrained into the body of Christ that there were certain things going on in the book of Acts that, that God doesn't do anymore. Let me tell you right now, as well patch, patch plain as I can, what I think of that doctrine. Blah, that's what I think of that doctrine. I can't be any more plain than that. There hasn't anything went away that God gave the church because it's still the church age. If he gave it to the church in the book of Acts, we have it now. Now, we might have forgot about it. We might not want any part of it. We might have taught against it. But it doesn't mean God took it anywhere because he didn't. If they could do it without a Bible, you and I can certainly do it with the Bible, because we have the, the, the revelations uh, that Paul wrote in those epistles all in one spot. And we have tape recorders and anointed preachers and teachers and evangelists and prophets. <clears throat> I left one out a bit. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And there's five different ways of looking at the very same words. So you really need to make sure you hear all five of them from time to time because they really do look at things differently. Like when Ron Evett looks at a crowd of people, he sees dead, red, get the law, save. The man that ordained me in the ministry was an evangelist. He see the, saw the same thing. He said, in fact, every time he got in front of a crowd, he saw a cowboy riding a bucking horse in hell and through the fire and the flame. And it just, just drove him to tell people about Jesus. And uh, uh, he laid hands on me and by ordination. And at that time, I, I knew I was born and raised Baptist. I knew how to tell people about Jesus and tell them how to get saved. But I didn't really have that, that anointing in there that an evangelist has. I was a Bible teacher, and uh, Glenn had laid, laid hands on me at the ordination, and I, did, you know, I didn't feel any big buzz go on or angels sing or anything like that. But not too long after that, I got in a, a meeting where people got up and, uh, and, and gave testimonies and did all th kind of things that they never did tell anybody how to get saved. They wanted people to come down front, which is fine. But uh, it'd be okay for somebody to get saved in his chair in the back of the room and then get them to come down front because if they don't come down front, you can get just as saved at the back corner of a room and step out the back door as you can get saved up at the altar. That's, that's a... That's a religious thing if you carry that too far. There's nothing wrong with coming to the altar. But there's nothing wrong with people getting saved, especially in this country up here. This is not the Bible built. And some of these guys are just not going to be real. They're lost. They don't have God on the inside. They're not going to come marching up in front of everybody. Some of them, some of them, personality types are different. 
I know my personality type, if I'd have been lost, there's no way I'd have walked up there in front of people. It just wouldn't ever happen. And I know people in my ministry, I've been in ministry a long time, I know people have come and told me about being born again at, at one of the meetings I did. And uh, I never knew it. They never told anybody for a long time. But there, there, one guy that told me was leading uh, praise and worship in a huge church out in Oregon had, uh, was going to commit suicide that night. Instead of committing suicide, he got born again, and he wound up with a wife and three beautiful daughters, the head of this worship, the worship of this great big church. And, uh, and he said, God wanted me to tell you that. I don't know why. And I said, where was that meeting? And he told me where it's the only meeting I ever did in that town. It's the worst meeting I ever did in my life. If, if you just... If you'd have told me there was one good thing come out of that meeting, I'd have said, you're a liar. <laughs> and it was just God showing up to let me know I'm on a need-to-know basis and I don't need to know everything. He'll show me what I need to know and I don't need to know everything. And I thought, you know what? That's a valuable lesson right there. Think I'll just preach the word and let the chips fall. And that's the best, the best I can do. So having said all that, I want you to know that these basics need to be revisited by the entire body of Christ all of the time, and here's why. If that church could do what they did in the length of time they did it, without all the bells and whistles we've got, then with what they did, if we'll look at what they did and we'll keep doing what they did, it'll keep working because it's the same God. It's the same principles. They're just very basic principles of faith. And if we'll do what God taught them to do, the results they got are the results we'll get. Plus, we have all this stuff they didn't have revealed yet. And we can incorporate that in there. Church, we should be light years ahead of that first church simply because as generations learn they teach the younger what it took them a lifetime to learn so the younger starts at a lot better place and they spend a lifetime learning and then they teach the younger and over a few generations this thing should be really gaining some big steam and it is the, the, the church in the world right now is huge and it's getting big fast. They cannot count the uh, new births going on in China. They, couldn't, they can't count them because the, the people got sense enough not to be telling anybody. Because they know one of these days China's going to shut that church down just like Russia's doing right now. And they don't want their names on the rolls of the official church. And, uh, but the the uh, born-again movement of God, the real thing in China, is people are being born again by thousands a minute. It's, it's an enormous revival, and it's uh, glorious. I believe the end-time revival of the, of the harvest is on. I believe the tares are being bundled. They've been being bundled for a while now. And uh, the devil has really overplayed his hands in politics and stuff, and they're about to get tied and plumb up and taken out of the way. And the church is going to rise up and harvest the wheat, and we're going to see some glorious meetings in every country in the world. And God hasn't forgot the United States of America. And when this thing picks up steam, coming around the world and it, this revival gets completely full in the United States, we're going to see some people who don't care anything about God all of a sudden say, what's this God stuff all about? As God lifts the blind, they're going to say, "What? tell me about that. People that have told you to leave them alone, leave me alone, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And then all of a sudden, what are you talking about? It's like that. Change in the spirit. Hallelujah. All right. So the, we studied the name of Jesus as a basic last week. That is one of the things that the church was running with. This week, I want to talk about the blood, um, the blood 
covenant agape of God. What they, what this early church had, the, the, the main thing that happened, they knew that the presence of God was in the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. What they found out in that upper room was that when that, that temple veil split, the Ark, the Holy Ghost came out of the Ark of the Covenant. And he left. Jesus was crucified, died. Then that Holy Spirit of God went down into hell and brought Jesus to life. And that's how Jesus rose from the dead. And then Jesus presented himself for 40 days and nights on the earth. And then he left and sent the one that had been in the temple and had been in Jesus to be in us. So when you say Jesus is Lord of my life, you become a temple of the Holy Ghost and the same spirit of God that was in Jesus is in us. John 14, 12, the things I do, you'll do, and greater things than these you'll do because I go to be with the Father, but I'm sending the one that was in me and he'll be in you. That's the a, that's a gospel. You read John 14, 15, 16, 17, then read it again. John 14, 15, 16, 17, and read it again. John 14, 15, 16, and 17, and read that and read that because that is the last thing Jesus taught his disciples, no one, he was going to be taken prisoner that very night. And he taught them what he needed them to hang on to until he got back in that upper room. So in that upper room, when uh, the Spirit of God came in there, like it, they it looked like a fire. The Spirit of God in this atmosphere looked like there was a fire in that upper room. And the fire set down on these people and then went inside of them. And there, so that they could see what had happened to them. And you don't think that's some kind of exciting? When, you, <laughs> when you've been spending your life having to go through a high priest with animal blood just to get somebody in there close enough to represent you before the Spirit of God to find out that there was a way for that, ten, that power of God, that Spirit of God that was in the Ark of the Covenant to get in you so you could be the Ark of the Covenant. Christian. Holy Spirit Ark. Wow! That's the that's gospel right there in a nutshell. Now, to understand that is not as easy for a 21st century American as it would be were you raised in a blood covenant environment where people still practice blood covenant. We practice in the United States contracts made with ink and we think it's funny when we break one of them. Somebody's always getting out of a contract. Fine print, you know. Where there's, we'll make this agreement, and then if it's not working, we'll do something else. That's what people have done with marriage, even Christian people. It's, it's uh, marriage has become a legal contract. And if it's not working, just break the contract and, Make another one with somebody else. It might work. If it doesn't, just break that one. Go make another one with somebody else. It might work. You might finally, Mr. Wright, that God intended for you to have your whole about it. Uh, there we go again. I'll tell you who Mr. Wright is. It's whoever that you, that you could live without, but you don't want to live without. That's Mr. Wright. If you, <laughs> if you don't want to live without him, you're on the right track. If you don't want to live without her, you're on the right track. If that's not what you're doing, you need to get off that track now. How's that good a marriage advice? You can tell I don't counsel a lot of... <laughs> Bible teachers don't make the best marriage counselors. 
but it's a it's a truth. Um, uh, it wants you because because why? Marriage is a picture of blood covenant agape. That's the title of this message: blood covenant agape. Now, I didn't say love on purpose because the English word love has a meaning closer to love. But when an American says love, they're thinking L-U-V, boing, boing, bomb, love, love, I love you. <laughs> and that is not what the Bible is talking about over 90% of the time. There were four words for love in the Greek language. Philia, Storgi, this is a Wyoming pronunciation of Greek. Philia, I can get close with that because Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love where they boo Santa Claus, is based on that word philia. It's a friendship love. It's an easy love because you like them because you like them and they like you and it's no pressure, no power in it much either. But it's there, and, it, and it's, it's good. It's not bad, it's good. But that's not the love the Bible's talking about. Storgi is not how you say that, probably. <laughs> is mother's love for her children. And it goes awry sometimes, and it sounds like this. I brought you into this world, I can take you out. <laughs> that's what it sounds like when it's, doesn't have any agape in it. <laughs> and it's also the love that people have their dogs and cats and, you know, storgy. <laughs> people look at me like, <clears throat> and then there's arrow slub, boing, boing, boing. And that's what, you know, it's candy for making babies. It's candy for a lot of things, but it's not agape. So when the Bible says love your brother, that's not what it's talking about. <laughs> it's not talking about philia, and it's not talking about storgi. It's talking about agape. It's a whole different high love. And at the time Jesus started saying agape, they're asking him questions about it because although they knew it was the word for love, they were not familiar with it at all. They were familiar with philia, storgi, eros. And Jesus kept talking about agape. And he taught it, and he taught it, and he taught it. And here's the reason why the Eastern mindset could get it quick and we can't. Because the Greek word agape is translating a Hebrew word, hasid, or hasid, or some other way that it's probably pronounced. H-E-S-E-D. Hesed could be. Let's say hesed this time. <laughs> hesed means to cut where blood flows. And in the culture of the Middle East, in the day that God talked to Abraham, cutting blood covenant was the way that man made contracts. You didn't write anything on ink. You gave your word in blood. And if you broke your word, you died. There was no way out of them. You want in, you're all in. You want out, you're dead. It's a no, it's a, it's a no way out, one way w word, but when it's a God covenant and you want in and you have to keep it and it's not easy and it doesn't look like it's working, you have a blood covenant partner, especially in the New Testament that's on the inside of you and you're going to be just fine. You just lean on the strength and power of Almighty God, and you're going to see it from his point of view instead of the world's. If you keep your confession right, you keep your faith on the promises of God, it's going to come out right. It's going to come out with power. It's going to come out working. He'll always cause you to triumph in Christ 
Jesus. When you read the New Testament, it says Christ, always translate it. Don't leave it in Greek. Religion will bend your brain by leaving English words in Greek. Christ is the anointed. If you're talking about the anointed, you have got to be talking about what he's anointed with. All anoint means is poured on, smeared all over, and rubbed into. In the case of the anointing of God, for a Christian, it's up, on, smeared all over, and rubbed into. Christian, little anointed one, with the power of God upon him. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to be a Christian if you know what you got into. It's a religious wreck if you don't. It's hard. There shouldn't be anything hard about Christianity other than the devil wants to stop you so you have a fight. We got to fight the good fight of faith, but that's not against people. That's against the principalities, powers, rulers of the dis darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places. Our fight is in the invisible in supernatural releasing of words and blood covenant and the name of Jesus and the blood of God. So when you and I, like the old Pentecostal people, plead the blood, what's that mean? I apply the blood of Jesus in this situation. I've been bought by the blood. According to the Bible uh, in Ephesians 1, 7, the blood of Jesus is what redeemed me. It bought me back from where Adam sold me and put me in the place Jesus bought and paid for me to have. The blood did that. According to Hebrews 13, 12, the blood sanctified me. I'm already sanctified. I'm not working to be sanctified. The blood sanctified me. I'm a spirit. Now, I'm going to have to work because my mind needs renewed. And there's, it doesn't happen miraculously. Your mind gets renewed because you spend time in the Word looking at things from God's point of view until you start to think like He thinks. And you get rid of some of that junk that collected up in there that's not agreeing with him. And you say, you know what? God I always thought this was true, but I can see here that what I think and what this says isn't quite lined up. And I'm telling you right now, I bow my knee to you. I bow my knee to the word. If the word says it, then that's the way it is. And I'll live by your word. Help me see. Help me see it from your perspective. Man, what a good prayer. That's how, you, that's how you change the way you look at religious ideas that really aren't flowing with what happened in the New Testament when the Spirit of God who was in the ark got inside of people. The whole different. The Old Testament and the New Testament are entirely different. The Old Testament is for you Make no mistake, it is not to you, and be very, 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 very careful about that. It's for you, not to you. The New Testament is to you. You can take it in, but just because it's behind the flyer that says New Testament, always ask yourself, who's talking and who are they talking to? especially the Gospels, because Jesus was a prophet under the Old Covenant. And very often, they'd ask him an Old Covenant question. He'd give them an Old Covenant answer. And that's red letters in our Bible, so we take that. This is in the New Testament. Well, it's in there, but that's, he wasn't talking to the church, and he wasn't answering a church question. So always ask yourself, who's talking and who are they talking to? What are they talking about? And when it's, when it's God talking to the church, you got to bend to that. If it's Jesus explaining the Old Covenant, you have to bend to that. It's, he fulfilled that. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem with the Old Covenant is nobody could keep it but Jesus. And you had to keep it to be made righteous. And if you can't keep it, you can't be made righteous by it. And that's what it was for, is to show people how bad they needed a Savior to do it for them. And Jesus did it for us, and thank God he did. And now... 
We're the righteousness of God in him. We just take what he said about us and we walk in that. We don't pick up what he wrote to the Gentiles. We don't pick up what he wrote to the Jews because we're not under the law and we're not strangers without a covenant. We have a covenant. We pick up the covenant promises. So when you read the Bible, there's three people groups with three deals. There's the lost Gentile and God has a deal with them. Do this or you stay there in that lost position. And it's pretty simple, Gentiles. Receive Jesus as Lord of your life. Come into church. <laughs> Leave that deal. It's not good. And take the church deal. It's, it's glorious. And then for the Jews, they have to receive that Jesus was the Messiah and come into the church. And if they don't, then they're held in their self under the other law. But don't get caught in between. Don't get caught trying to keep Old Testament traditions in order to walk in the New Testament because it won't work. It makes people cranky. How many of you know when you're trying to get something from God and it ain't working, it doesn't do your attitude a whole lot of good? You know what makes you happy? Victory! Winning! Oh, I think it's just how you play the game. And you know what the Bible says about lying? It's not just how you play the game. We're here to win. And God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Is that 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 2? 2 Corinthians 2.14? 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, this is... Uh, a Bible truth. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in and translate Christ. Don't leave it in that religious state of Greek. You're not Greek, you don't speak Greek, and it doesn't make any sense in Greek. Get it over into English. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in the anointed one and the anointing he's anointed with that lives on the inside of us. So we're Christians or anointed ones. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have a covenant with Almighty God that's made not in the blood of goats or heifers, but it's made in the blood of God himself. The blood that flowed through Jesus' veins had no sin in it because there was no male had anything to do with his blood type. Mary was found pregnant. The Holy Spirit impregnated her womb. And the blood in the veins of Jesus had no Adam mistake in it. Jesus had the same blood in his veins that Adam and Eve uh, had in the garden. Glories in it. Couldn't die. Shot full of light. Actually, when Jesus came back from the dead, he said, handle me. Uh, spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He didn't say flesh and blood. He's not running on blood now. His blood's in a basin in heaven. What's that new body run on? Glory. Anointing power, light. Oh, I'm getting side Try to get it back to work here. The, the blood, the reason that Christians in America have so much trouble stemming off and fighting off religious ideas is they really have to learn what blood covenant's all about in order to understand that God made a blood covenant with us. Jesus, God, Almighty God, walked through the blood of a heifer cut in two while Abraham slept. Actually, he was slain in the spirit. 
God put him to sleep so that he couldn't walk in those blood heads because he couldn't keep it and God couldn't afford to have it broke. God come down and walked through that heifer that he cut, that Abraham cut in two. And he swore his side of the new covenant with Jesus. 2,000 years later, 2,000 years of word, Jesus got on the cross and shed his blood on his half of that blood covenant was the blood of God into the atmosphere. Every drop out of him, that's what the crucifixion was for, to get every drop of blood in Jesus out of his body or into the sack and his lungs, just blow his lungs, and then when they run that spear up in there, it punctured whatever was left, whatever drop of blood was left in him come out. Why? One drop of that God blood in him, he couldn't, that body couldn't die. It had to have that life out of it in order to die. That body was sustained by blood that you and I don't have. Hallelujah. This blood covenant, agape in Greek, hasid in Hebrew, is what it takes to keep your word because you gave your word. Not because it's working for you. Not because it looks like it was the right thing to do. Jesus is in the garden that night. He said, hey, if there's any other way, I don't want to do it. This. Let this pass. Then he said, nevertheless, drink the cup and here we go. So he heard God. It was pretty obvious what he said. There is no other way. And Jesus said, then we'll do it your way. Why? Because he always did what the Father Ask, and he never did anything otherwise. And he did the hardest thing he ever did. And, and surrendered his life on our behalf and died. Third person of the, in the Godhead, one of the three in the Godhead, no longer. There were two. He died. For three days and three nights, he was gone. If you read Psalm 22, you'll, you'll get the word that Jesus was believing in that pit. They're the words that kept him, wait, kept him expectant, even in hell, believing God would come and get him. Man, how much faith does it take We'll never have to know. He did that so we wouldn't have to. We couldn't if we wanted to. But Jesus could. So he did it. And when he come up out of there, he said, hey, I got the keys back. I got the light back. I've got everything Adam lost back. Now I'm giving it to you. You go and in my name, you use it. Go with it. Don't go with the Old Testament. Take the new one. Don't go with the old deal. Get that new one. It's better. The new one's good. The old one won't work. Take the new one. And don't mix it up. You take a little cow manure and a glass of water, just how much of it you're going to stir in there before you know it's not any good. Is that too blunt? I'm thinking one tiny little drop's probably a little too much. Keep the law out of the New Testament. Jesus nailed it to the tree because he don't want it. He doesn't want it anywhere near us. You've been made the righteousness of God and there's not anything you can do to get sanctified. The blood sanctified you. We're back on track. Praise the Lord. The blood remitted our sin. Ephesians 1.17. Just wiped it completely out. The blood isn't atoned for. There's one time in the King James Bible they made a translation mistake and used the word atonement. Atonement is Old Testament. The New Testament, the blood of Jesus eliminated it. it, it it's as if sin never existed. It's absolutely gone. It is not the problem now. 
It's what the lost man has to forsake. But Jesus fixed it. If you want out from under it, you just say, Jesus is Lord of my life, and you're out from under it. And the only thing that could keep you under there now is a lie from hell that tells you you've got to do something. It's, it, 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 you just got to believe a t part of the law, part of the grace, part of the old, part of the new. That's religion. The way into the presence of God, the real thing, Christianity, there's no mixture whatsoever. You put the old where it belongs, and you walk in the new. Hallelujah. By faith in the word of God. So, in order to understand Hasid, you look at blood covenant. I'm not going to take a lot of time to do that tonight, but I'll just tell you, when those people made a covenant, they found out what this word agape is. Because how many of you know it's not the easiest thing in the world to keep a covenant? It's not. Why? Because people are people and they're not perfect and they're going to make a mistake from time to time and they're going to, they're, they're going to do something that they're not supposed to be doing because of that covenant. Now, you're tied to that covenant, and it's not predicated on what they do. This is what people don't seem to want to get a hold of. Agape love is not based on what the other person does in reciprocation for what you're doing. It's not based on their doing this because you did this, and you do this because they did that. That's nice. That's polite. That's kind of friendly, but that's not what agape love is. Agape love is going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's shot full of honor, and it's going to keep doing what's right because it's set it to do what's right, and it's not breaking word because the other person isn't walking in it, right? You just pray, and you believe God, and you receive supernatural change in people, and you keep doing right on, keep doing right on the right thing time after time after time after time after time because you've got agape on the line. Amen. Not love. You've got agape on it. It's so much stronger than these silly fleshy loves. There's four Greek words for love. I don't know. There might be 50 or 60 of these fleshy feelings floating around all the time. And none of them are agape. Now, I'll tell you what. There isn't anything more dynamic than philia mixed with agape so that you've got a friendship that's... You've got a friendship made between two Christians and the anointing, Almighty God and the Holy Ghost, and there's nothing like it. There's nothing wrong with philia. It's just weak unless it's, unless it's teamed with agape. There's nothing wrong with storgi, except it'll turn on you unless it's mixed with agape. There's nothing wrong with arrows except you're not going to get every, up every morning with your heart going pitter-pat. <laughs> I'm just going to do this for married couples. Someday, you're going to get up and say, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not either. Okay. When you want to come out of la-la land, come see me. <laughs> I mean, people are people. There is no Mr. Right that's right enough that you're not going to wake up some morning and say, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> and when that day hits, you just grab hold of that marriage license and you look, you look at it and you read what you already did. I can't believe I did it. Well, you did. And if you did it right, it doesn't matter what you sign with the ink. It's what you stood up there and said before God. I tie myself. In the name of Jesus, I agape. 
I'm in, I'm all in. And it's not based on whether they stay in or not. I'm in, I'm staying. You find somebody that can do that too and you've got a marriage that'll work. It'll hold up under pressure and there'll be some, but the good news is it don't last very long. When you come up, you come up against it, a united couple holding up the word of God, you might be a little friction going on between you, but there's three of you in that marriage and there's never any friction. God's not involved in that friction stuff. Just remember when you get married, Christian marriage, it's not man and wife, it's man and wife and God. It's a three-way cord, and it works, provided the two people involved can keep the word of God in their spirit more important than the natural thinking in their head. This is where we lose track of covenants made, not here, for the people listening without seeing, not down, you don't lose it in your spirit. Your spirit's somewhere south of your nose, down around your heart area, on the inside of your temple of the Holy Ghost. Actually, there's three of you. If you could see me, I'm three parts. And you'd see my body, which you can, or at least Thank God, say thank God, just my face and my hands. But you can tell there's a body in here because the clothes are moving around. It's supposed to be a joke, but I'm not getting a lot of laughs. <laughs> now, then there'd be another mic here. It'd be my soul. It looked just like me, if you could see it. And it's the thinker. It's where my will and my emotions are at. It's where... Um, it's where um, I figure things out. There's a strength called willpower here. And there's a supernatural part of the, of, uh, the God hookup called hope that operates in my imagination, in my image station that's in my mind. Then over here, you see another one. It looks just like the other two. My, the spirit only difference is it's shining. Why? It's perfect. It's made in the righteousness of God in his image. Can't even see it because it's so light. But it would look just like the other two if you could see it. And that's who I am. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in this body. And the bodies are forever. I'm going to get one like Jesus has got someday. Then it's going to work right like his works. It won't run on blood. It'll run on glory like his does. And I'll be able to go anywhere with it. Galaxy to galaxy. Heavens to heaven. How many of you know the heavens right here? It's just in a different, operating in a different speed. We can't see it. We're not in it because it's the light's the speed's different. God slowed things down when he said, let there be light. Things slowed down to 180,000 miles per second. Is that what it is? Speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. Slowed down, and you could see something in this realm. It doesn't make this realm more real. That one made this one. That one's more real. But God likes this one so much that there's coming a day when he's going to bring his heavenly city He's going to fix his planet back up from what sin did to it after a thousand year millennium. And he's bringing the heavenly city down, putting it down here. Because he likes this place a lot. He's going to put it in Jerusalem. Because that's, I believe I could prove if I had a couple, three more meetings. That city's his bride. It's the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. That'll, that'll open up some cans that I'll just have to live with, I guess. <laughs> I know not everybody's going to agree with that, and they, you know what, I'm not here to pick a fight. I'm here to get you, to, I'm, I'm here to get, look at a Bible basic and have it expand. Have a Bible basic become so real on the inside of us 
that we're, we're, we don't get taken off on these new goofy ideas that you have to throw some Bible out even to believe. You just stay right here in what, this, what the early church was doing. And when we get as good at it as they were, we're going to get the results they were getting to hallelujah. All right, so uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, how many of you know what that says? Now abide these three, faith, hope, and charity. In English, they're trying to get across something besides love. So they translated that word agape, charity, that time. And it probably was a pretty good King James word because charity had a different meaning then than it does now. Now when you think charity, you're thinking alms and somebody's a charity case and you're given to the, you're given to the needy. That's part of agape, but it's a small part. Agape uh, is, and that's what I want to get to tonight, and I'll, I'll get this out. The way to say it in English, to get the full meaning as quick as we possibly can in our culture without understanding blood covenant very well is agape, hasid, loving kindness, mercy, grace. You have to understand all those, have a bit of an understanding of all those words and see them come together. It's who God is. God is love. In fact, I think we'll end there with this message. Since it never really got off the ground, we might as well end in a hot spot. 1 John 4, 16. <laughs> 1 John chapter 4. I think I'll start in 15. Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. So there you go. Who's a Christian? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and dwelleth and I dwell in him. Or Jesus is my Lord. Okay, verse 15, whoever shall confess, I did 16, and we have known and believed the agape. Please read First John several times and translate love to agape every time just to get the full meaning. We, we have believed the agape that God hath to us. God is agape, and he that dwelleth in agape dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our agape made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, that's, a, that's something to read every day. You can read those four verses every day out loud, loud, right off the bat. Kick your day off right. Let the devil know that you know who you are in Christ Jesus. And if he wants to fight, you got one for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No sense running from that sucker. One thing he does is be persistent. His job's to kill, steal, and destroy, and he never quits. So when you get up in the morning, hit him first. Right between the eyes, and then jump on him and keep him under your feet all day long. What he's for in the New Testament is a footstool of the body of Christ. Jesus said he's waiting for his enemy to be made his footstool, and you and I have the feet we're the ones in the earth back in his anointing. We're the ones he sent here and said, you go now and in my name you do what I was doing. Keep him on your feet. Stay on top of him. Keep him there. If he wiggles, stomp him. Hallelujah. It's fun to be a Christian. 
I got a big rowdy amen out of that, but then I'm in Wyoming. <laughs> Boy, if I'd have said that in Texas, the place would have went upside, people turn inside out. In Wyoming, people were, hmm. <laughs> it's okay, we all learn different. But all, all I'm doing right now anyway is firing up a truth that's on the inside of anybody that's ever said Jesus is Lord. This is in there. Your spirit knows it's in there. And these basics start making you, start making your inner man do flip-flops. And it starts to change the way you think. And you start to consider, you know, do I really need to talk about sin so much when God's aimed me at it? I need to talk to it, not about it. Talk to the mountain. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe those things you say will come to pass. You're going in the sea in Jesus' name. Get! Amen. Hallelujah. That's how you pray for the flu. You don't run, get a mask, keep old people at bay. You walk right up to it. Lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You get off of them in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the healing power of God. And no fool can stand up against that in Jesus' name. And mean it when you say it. Make that junk tremble. And run and hide like the coward it is. It's nothing but the curse. And you and I have been blessed by Almighty God, and our job is to kick that curse out every time we see it. And it's not to run and hide from it, it's to take it on and fight it and beat it every time He always causes us to triumph in Christ. I don't know if you're getting fired up or not, but I am glory to God. <laughs> This basic faith stuff that the early church walked is too good not to look at more often than we do. It really is. It nothing went away. We just quit taking advantage of it. Hallelujah. So, Romans 5, 9 said that the blood of Jesus justified us. And that word justified, every time you see it in the English, it means just as if I'd never sinned. Amen. That's the best definition to justify you can find. And every time you read it, the blood did that for you. You don't have to do anything. The blood did that. You say, Jesus is Lord of my life. He justified. I'm justified. I stand justified before Almighty God in the court of the universe. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face that high court one day. You are too. And when the case is presented for what I did, what right and what I did wrong, well, however that's going to go, the gavel's going to fall and the verdict's going to be not guilty, but by the blood. Amen. Bam! The blood of Jesus is what it cost God to buy you and me back from where Adam sold us. It's just that simple. And the, the reason he did it was because he so agopied us. He so agopied us that he would, God so loved the world. God so loved the world that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal, absolute, zoe life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Basics. Basics. The blood did that. You and I receive it by believing that in our heart and saying it with our mouth. And don't think you get anything else from God any other way. Every single thing God gave us is in the form of a promise. We take that promise just like we did the new birth. And we say, God, you bought and paid for my healing, then by his stripes I'm healed. I'm healed and well and whole, and I'm not basing it on how I feel or how I smell 
or how much I'm coughing and hacking and gagging and I'm basing it on your word. Your word said that I'm healed, then I say I'm healed. I agree with you. I'm the healed. I'm not sick. I'm the healed. Sickness is trying to come on my body. I won't take it in the name of Jesus. It's not mine. I'm not taking possession of it. I'm free. I'm justified. I've been bought and paid for, and I'm not having it in Jesus' name. It's hard to do when you're sick. I found that out a couple weeks ago. I also found out you better do it anywhere. You could be sick a long time. Pick up the pace. Pick up the fight. Doesn't matter what you feel like when you're doing what God said to do. It matters that you're doing what God said to do. And you start doing what God said to do, it's amazing what it'll do to turn your feelings around. Remember, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he dwells in God. And we have known and believed the agape that God hath to us. And so now, to end this, we've known and believed the agape, hasid, loving kindness, mercy, grace, and I think that's where we'll start next week because that word grace will tie, start tying this, this, this basic together. We're under grace in the New Testament. And that grace is a very, very, in fact, grace takes all this, all this what we're talking about and kind of brings it all together in the New Testament. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your word. I thank you for the patience of these people tonight. And uh, I thank you that because they spent time with you and hearing you, that there's things happening on the inside of them right now that couldn't, did, you just couldn't get to them if they hadn't been here under your word this long in one evening. So I thank you that things are going on in their bodies, whether they know it or not, and it's all good. Things are going on in their mind, and it's all good. And things that you've had in, activated in their spirit since the day they got born again are being, are being energized and, and, and they grow tonight because of the word that they've heard. The basic word is firing that up in them. It's getting big, big. It's getting to where it's easier to get up in the morning and know I'm not tied to this place. God sent me here to represent him while I'm here, but I'm not tied here. I'm living a high life. I'm not getting caught in a slow one. I thank you that's inside of us and fired up in us. In Jesus' name, I say you're blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the city, and blessed in the field. In Jesus' name, amen.